Well, welcome everybody to this um, online Zoom event organised by the Norman Nicholson Society. And uh, we're absolutely delighted to welcome Ruth Sutton to talk to us this evening and just share some of her experiences and also to talk about this, this uh, wonderful new initiative that she's working on at the moment. Just a little bit of background and Ruth will correct me when I go wrong here. Ruth is a retired education consultant who lives in West Cumbria. She began writing in 2012. She first published a trilogy of novels following the fortunes of a woman living in West Cumbria in the first half of the 20th century. And then she followed on from that with a series of really riveting crime novels with links to that original trilogy, but set in the second half of the 20th century and all in the midst of the wonderful scenery of West Cumbria. And the West, by the way, is important as I discovered when I was talking to Ruth the other day. And I mentioned the fact that uh, the novels were set in Cumbria. No, West Cumbria. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, quite. Yeah, we're with you on that. Um, but Ruth has built up a, a devoted following of readers who are all locked on to the adventures of detective Tony Relly and the news hound Judith Farrow. Uh, more recently, Ruth has been working on her first play, Day the Iron Works Closed, which will be staged at the Beggars Theatre in Milham on November the 4th and 5th. And of course, the Iron Works and its closing in 1968 is an important and recurring theme in Norman Nicholson's writing. So I'm sure we're all keen to know Ruth's take on this. So Ruth, first of all, a very warm welcome to the Norman Nicholson Society. Thank you very much, Charlie, and thank you for the introduction as well. Absolutely spot on. Great. OK, I'm doing all right so far. Then. Um, the, ob the obvious question, Ruth, is where did the idea come from to write this play? Well, I was um, had been thinking about writing something about Hodbarrow for quite a long time. The Hodbarrow uh, Iron Mine, um, Hematite Mine. Um, but lockdown got in the way of my access to the local history libraries, obviously. So that was a kind of on the back burner. And then I was approached by a, an arts project called Deep Time. And I think, they're, I think the de definite description is a public art programme set on the Lake District coast. Now, I'm not too happy about Lake District coast, actually, but leaving that aside for the time being, they were looking for creative artists to work on the subject of Cumbria's industrial heritage, industrial past, hence the title. And they have a number of uh, visual artists, but they also were commissioning five writers. And they decided to ask if I would be one of their commissioned writers and produce something for them on the industrial history of West Cumbria, which I was delighted to do because it's part of the fascination that I have for this area. Um, their time scale at the time was quite tight. It was the approach was made probably um, at the beginning, maybe the end of last year, the beginning of this year, and they wanted something by September of this year. And I knew from past experience that I couldn't produce a 90,000, 100,000 word novel, research planned, written um, in that time frame. So I wondered what I could do that would. Um, build, draw from the industrial history. I didn't fancy the short story. It's not a, it's not a genre I'm, or a, a structure I'm very good at. So I thought, well, why not make a play out of this? And because I, I, I enjoy writing dialogue. So and I've never tried it before. So I thought, well, this is something uh, that I'm being prompted to do and it would help me to learn something different. So I said I would do it and I said I would write a play and they were very pleased. And um, I just got on and started the research then on um, the ironworks, talked to a lot of people, read a lot of stuff, talked to people like Sue Dawson, um, hello Sue, who was um, in Millham on the day that the ironworks closed when it all kicked off and gathered enough information to put something together that I felt was going to be respectful of the, the facts of the case, but also capturing some of the the impact, not just the technical details, but the impact of this event on the town mm. in, in the form of a, a play set on a single day in a single house, in a single street in Millham with the ironworks as the backdrop. So that's where the day the ironworks closed came from. 
did did you have um, a detailed knowledge of the ironworks and the impact of its closure before you began doing your research? I, I, I remember when I was at university in Manchester in 68, um, being very aware of what was happening in Millham because our, all our childhood holidays had been spent in Sailcroft. So Millham was the town where we spent those holidays and childhood holidays, as we all know, are very have a huge impact on, on your memory. So I remembered Millham. I was very, I was studying politics and history at university in Manchester. I was very struck by um, the economic impacts of a sudden closure like this on a town which I knew. I remember reading up about it, um, but that was as much as I knew, apart from knowing that it had happened, knowing where the ironworks had been, having had some conversation with people in the town about that, that era, uh, but that was, it, that was it. I had the detail I really had to go and dig up. I went and talked to David Boy, for example, who was an absolute mine of information about the technical side. Very, very useful conversations I had with, with him, with Sue, with a whole bunch of other people around the town as well. So you won't have made the mistake that some people have made about the Bessemer process then at uh, Miller Mine Works. No, no, and um, Nicholson made that mistake himself, I understand. So no, I had to be a bit more careful than that. Uh, and I had to leave alone things like the, the intimate workings of an iron um, furnacing process that I don't really understand. And it, it, was, it was the family and the work rather than the technical details of hematite and its processing that I was interested in. I mean, it, 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 it talked about um, the challenge of writing dialogue for a play. Mm. But in a book, you write dialogue. Yeah. And quite often the dialogue is, you know, unblemished for want of a better word. It just flows, you know, from one person to the other. Was it much of a leap then to transfer that process to a dramatic setting? No, it wasn't really. Um, as I said, I, I thought a play might work for me because I do like writing dialogue. And um, it, it's the same challenge that you have in, a, in a, a, a setting with dialect and particular uh, vocabulary, that you have to find the happy medium between the, the true Millam voice and the capacity of other people outside Millam to understand what's being said. So, and that challenge, uh, the line between authenticity and intelligibility, generalized intelligibility, that's the line you have to try and find in writing fiction anyway. And I, and I had to try the, my best to do the same in the play. So it, was, it wasn't presenting me with challenges I hadn't met before. Uh, but I suppose one challenge is uh, when you're writing a novel, if you want to give the reader information by way of context, mm. it's easy to do, you just write it in. But in a play, it has to happen, doesn't it? It has to be. Was that a bit tricky? It is, it is tricky. Um, the, one of the interesting aspects of the closure was the complexity, not just the technical complexity, but the socio-economic political complexity of what was going on around the event itself. Uh, although people in Milan tended to see it as an in, a, a sort of a, a local issue, it was not, it was by no means a local issue. It was a, it was a product of global forces in terms of import of iron, um, the, the price of uh, imported iron, the uh, difficulty of competing with internal, with um, imported um, iron, and, and the multi-national um, owners based in Spain, the Labour government, the, the year 1968, the, the political unrest that was around, the anxiety about that in, in political circles, all that. So somewhere in the beginning of the play, in the first scene, you've got to kind of drop in little hints about what was going on. Just people picking up a newspaper or um, asking a question or whatever without making speeches about it. Mm. But I did actually, I am actually copying out a little bit by introducing the play with a short video about the year 1968. Because for those people younger than us who don't remember 1968, I think they're missing something about the closure if they don't understand the backdrop on um, which it was set against. 
and the it was a very monumental year was 1968 and the little video at the beginning if we can find all the images that we want and string them together will be setting some kind of context into which the local story of the closure will then sit but I couldn't I couldn't do all that in the play itself without it becoming a diatribe so I've, yeah. I've copped out a bit because uh, 1968 was also the year that Radio Caroline North went off the air, so that was another significant what can post. Say? What can I tell you? Yes, indeed. All our lives were a lot poorer for that. <laughs> uh, I'll invite questions from from the, the the floor in a moment, but just before we do, Ruth, I just want to um, ask you something, and I have, I've got a, a pretty good idea. There's an impressive answer coming this coming my way. Um, your involvement with this play is not simply writing it, is it? Uh, no. Um, Jackie Moore and I, Jackie Moore from the Beggars Theatre, who I approached very early on about making sure that we produced this play by Millam, for Millam, in Millam, if you like, which is what, what I'm trying to achieve. I, we talked about it months ago and she was very excited about the idea. And the Beggars, I mean, the Beggars is on Market Square, which is where all this stuff, all the big demonstration about when the ironworks closed in that afternoon of Friday, the 13th of September, 68, that there it is right in the middle. So all the action, some of the action of the play takes place right outside the theater in which we're going to produce it. So Jackie and I talked at the very beginning about doing this play as a joint project. And I wanted to be part of the, I suppose the production of the play, the staging of it, um, she's got all the expertise about theater and she's a professional actress so she'll have more input than i will into the actual um rehearsing the lines and setting you know doing all the sort of technical stuff about the script itself but i'm i'm very busy working with the set designer the lighting designer um the video constructing person um i'm working with uh, bry cooper who does the millum of yesteryear photos about doing a display of photos after the play is over. Uh, we've got the Normals Nicholson poem involved in the play as well, and a song, which I'm busy writing. So it's kind of, uh, putting all that together is my job, making it run as a, as, a, as a whole. And Jackie is very instrumental in helping me to do the auditions, which we've almost finished now, and then we'll be instrumental in the, in the rehearsing as well. Couldn't be doing this without Jackie. No, absolutely not. I mean, Jackie's a star, but you yeah. you have taken on a heck of a commitment. Well, I mean, what else have I got to do? You know, I mean, <laughs> here I am, retired, time on my hands, um, living in the area, interested in the area. It's an absolute dream project, really. Terrific. OK. All right. So has anybody else got any questions that you'd like to fire to Ruth while we've got the chance? Uh, if so, please either unmute and speak or just wave like fury. So it was just um hello just Sue. Hi Ruth. Um it's just a point that came up when we had our little chat to Ruth that time ago, and uh, I, I don't know whether other people are aware, but I believe you talked about an issue that was happening in Barrow at the time. Yeah. It was it was it a strike action or yeah. was it a dispute or it was strike action. Something that I wasn't I, I just wonder whether or not you'd be able to maybe elaborate a little bit more yeah. on that sir yeah that's that was i think that was <laughs> critical actually the engineers had been on strike since june and they stayed on the shipyard engineers um they stayed on strike until december it was a long fairly bitter strike um and it was it was about paying conditions as they always are but it was also about the um building of the nuclear submarines 68 was still an era where the whole idea of nuclear weapons, nuclear submarines was very contentious. And Barrow, the, the strike was, met, made the front pages, let's put it that way. Certainly it was paid day after day, week after week in the evening mail, the Barrow engineers strike was on the front page. And I, I've often wondered, I have no evidence of this, whether the, the government's anxiety about its nuclear submarines program being at the mercy of the engineers in Barrow in the, in the yard, which it was, 
whether that anxiety translated itself into an anxiety about Milam as well. And particularly when they were, the government were being asked to fund the upscaling of a steel making process that had been pioneered in Milham, um, a, a new method of making steel through spraying, mm. which was called mill spray after Milham. And to keep the, one of the ways of keeping the ironworks going would have been to scale up from the experimental project that they'd done into a larger process to make steel. But would the government want to put Millam in charge of a, a big project like that when just down the road? And don't forget that when you're in London, Millam and Barrow are like next to each other. Yeah. Which they're not. We know that, but they didn't know that. Would they do they worry about industrial relations in Furnace as a result of what was happening with the engineers in Barrow? And I do wonder whether they did. Mm. Mm. There was a. Can I carry on with this a minute, Charlie? There was a, in the First World War, there was a ship, uh, um, an airship program in Barrow, building airships. And the government we know from the cabinet papers in the middle of the, the war was very worried about um, send, making Barrow the center of the airship building program because Barrow was considered to be politically problematic. Uh, it, the, the, it was very contentious times. There was the um, the revolution in Russia. There were uh, revolutions in, b beginning in Germany, and the the cabinet did worry that if there was going to be a revolution in England in the at the same time, it would probably start in somewhere like Barrow, if not in Barrow itself. So that anxiety about this area, its industrial strength at the time, its physical and geographical isolation, and its political leftness, which was very marked at the time that we're talking about, all those factors together, I think, may have caused the government to hesitate about funding and supporting the retention of the Miller Mine Works. And it was that very hesitation, which went on for weeks, if not months, that finally made the owners pull the plug. They just, mm -hmm. they couldn't get answers to the questions they wanted about the future because for whatever reasons, the Labour government, Harold Wilson's Labour government was not prepared to commit itself. And I, I have wondered whether or not the history of that distrust of this area had anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. I, I think, answer, sorry. Sorry, I was just say I thought all that was that was fascinating. That was just totally unknown to me. All, all of that, um, you know, historical uh, context, if yeah. you like. And, well, when I went, I went to the local history library looking through the evening mail, obviously for uh, news of the Millam closure, and I was I was horrified to see. Well, shocked, not horrified, but surprised to see that day after day, night after night, it was the Barrow engineer strike that made the front page. And you had to look for information about the Mill and Ironworks in the inside pages, which gives you an indication of how these stories were regarded. And even on the day of the closure, on the Friday, the September the 13th, the Millam, the Millam story was on page 12 in the evening mail. Now, what you know, that's very interesting to me that even the Barrow paper didn't regard what was happening in Millam as, as a major consequence. When of course, it was absolutely traumatic mm -hmm. happening in Millam. And I don't know why it took people so long to realize that this mm -hmm. was a disaster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my rant over, I've finished now. <laughs> no, I, I just felt that was fascinating to hear all of that because mm -hmm. obviously when you live here and I was only, only a teenager at the time, you're not aware of the, of the larger issues no might be influencing the decision making that's uh, that's going on yeah. so and I think one of the other things as well that we perhaps uh, when I've spoken to people who've been involved directly with the ironworks was the the speed with which it happened which is from what you're saying the papers weren't picking that up at all were they they, they weren't either unaware or not wanting to acknowledge that this was going to happen very very quickly well I think for a long time people were in denial it was the order book was full. Mill spray yes. was coming. Yeah. Um, it, it was not. It didn't look like a place that was about to collapse. Mm. 
-hmm. So there was a fair amount of denial. There was a fair amount of optimism, whether it was misplaced, was misplaced. And because the government didn't say no, we won't support this process. We won't support, we won't renationalize. We won't intervene because they didn't say anything. I think it was that 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 just postponed <clears throat> the feeling that something was going to happen. Mm. And even on the day, and even immediately after the day, some of the men who worked there, some of the people involved, felt that this was some kind of game that was going on, and that maybe they wanted, you know, to reduce um, pay or increase hours or made some differences to the paying conditions. That it was the kind, it was part of the negotiation, not a, an, a, a precursor to the actual pulling of the plug. Mm -hmm. And I think in the end, the, the owners just got impatient because they weren't getting any answers. That was mm -hmm. the tragedy. If they'd mm -hmm. said early on, in six months time, this place will have to close. If the government had been indicating that that was the case, if the owners had indicated that was the case, there might have been some kind of managed reduction in the manpower. But to, to sack 400, 500 blokes on the same day mm. in a town of this size, well, that was unconscionable. And that's what they ended up doing. Mm. It, was the, it was that sudden collapse and throwing all these blokes on the, on the labor market simultaneously, that was the tragedy of it. Mm. From, from what I was able to gather, the the, the the main reason for the closure was the government's decision of the British Iron and Steel Board, uh, uh, which was really the poodle of the government, uh, not to nationalise mill and mine works. Yeah. yeah. All the rest of the UK steel industry was nationalised, presumably with... Uh, generous compensation to the former owners, but Millen was left out on a limb, not nationalised and losing money. So the, the, the owners faced with uh, hemorrhaging lots more money decided to close it. Uh, and they were, they were I, I think they were quite dumbfounded too that it hadn't been nationalised. Mm. The, the decision not to nationalise it was this British Iron and Steel Board was sewn up by the major UK steel companies of the day, United Steel and Stewart's and Lloyd's and whatever, whereas the owners of Millam Ironworks were a tiddler. They were a general engineering company. They weren't a mainstream iron and steel producer, so they were on the periphery of of that sort of cartel. And it, 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 I think it was as much of a much of a shock to them mm. as it was to anyone else. Mm. And from conversations I had with the guy who was the managing director at the time, he he was very bitter about it. Uh, you know, about the political uh, jiggery-pokery that had gone on and they, he found it quite an inexplicable decision, yeah. which, it, which it was at the time. And the, the irony was, or the, the, one of the tragedies of the, of the situation was that as on the day or the, the overnight after the closure, somebody strung up an effigy on one of the furnaces and it was an effigy dressed as a manager. It wasn't in working clothes, it was in a suit. And it, it, it's, that, that was a very sad reflection of the men's feeling that they'd been sold out by the management. Yeah, but as David yeah. is saying, it, the local management were as devastated as anybody else that, that, that this had actually happened. It was the, the forces at work were much bigger than just the owners, the mine, and the workers. They were. It was a much bigger situation that was behind it. Yeah, all. It, it's understandable. That people look for scapegoats. They did. They the, did. Yeah. The, yeah. You, you see it at Workington, and yeah, what what's happened there? You know, they they, they all blame Margaret Thatcher, which isn't uh, 
which is a gross oversimplification. It was fun, though, wasn't it? <laughs> One of your political views. <laughs> yeah, it was. I mean, I, as a historian myself, I suppose I, I'm bringing to it an interest in complexity. But the challenge was to try and get some of that complexity into a very simple play. The, the, I was reflecting as well that the sad thing, <clears throat> the sad thing was this in the 70s and 80s, there were very generous redundancy compensation schemes on the go linked to the European coal and steel community in the EU common market, the European Union at the time. And because the closure happened before, before all that, yeah, yeah. Midham lost out on yep. many millions yeah. of, of redundancy benefits through that scheme. The redundancy benefits available to nationalised redundant steel workers were uh, generous in the extreme, you know, to the extent that it was worth it, 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 they were a lot better off just stopping work than uh, carrying on working. They were, uh, you know, it just wasn't worth a lot than carrying on working. There was no contest. So, so that 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 was that that was uh, the the timing was very unfortunate That's for Millam's economy, yeah. old economy, and he doesn't really. He doesn't really recover, does it? No. no. Uh, Ruth, you, you mentioned um, uh, you mentioned that um, Norman's poem was going to yeah. feature in the play. This is on, yeah. on the closing of Miller Ironworks. Yeah. How, how have you managed to weave that into what you're producing? It's like, well, I've made it almost a coda of the play. Um, I... I this, is, this is a very sort of ex attenuated link. But I remember seeing a Shakespeare uh, coming from the Globe, and at the very end of the play, the cast dance, uh, as was the case apparently in the original productions at the Globe in, in Shakespeare's time. And it, as a way of bringing the play to some kind of conclusion with a, a, something done by the cast as a whole, I was, I was knocked out by that when I saw it. So, I thought, what better way to end this play than by having the cast re uh, speak Norman's poem? Not just one person, but to, they share the reading of this poem across the front of the stage. Uh, that, if, it, if it works, I hope it does. Um, because the play itself is quite, no, sorry, the poem is quite long. So I tried to make the play a way of summarizing what we're trying to say about the impact of this event on the town. And it, and it fits. Um, I'm not saying the play was built round it, but um, certainly I had the poem in mind when I was thinking about how to bring the play to a conclusion. And there, there is a, a passion in that poem. There is. I've already detected in your description of the research you've done and the information you've gathered, yeah. which going to implant into the drama? I hope so. I do hope so. Um, he got, it's a, it's a great poem, really. Um, and he gets this, the, the elements of, I mean, I've got this in the play myself, that the impact on the, on the climate of the, all this industry in the town and your, your washing gets filthy and, and the, if the wind's in a certain direction, then you, know, you get smuts everywhere. And those kind of things are part of the town. And he, and, he, and he ends the poem, and what's the good of knowing, because there was a way of, you know, you always knew if the wind was in this direction, you didn't put your washing out. What's the good of knowing which way the wind is blowing when whichever way it blows, it's a cold wind now. And I just thought, you know, this, it's full of lines like that, that are so reminiscent of normal working life in this town and how that's going to change as a result of what's going on. Okay, yeah. anybody else got any questions to, to chip in with uh, Ruth now while, while we've got the opportunity? Maggie. These are very boring questions really, but I'd be interested to know a bit about the Beggar's Theatre and what kind of a cast it is, whether it's, you know, local Amdram or not. 
And another question is, I'd just be interested to know who the other four writers were who were chosen for the um, scheme. Oh, now to take the last one first, I don't, I, I haven't got their names at my fingertips. If you go on, um, go on Google and look for the Deep Time Arts Project, you'll probably, you'll find those writers. I, my beef with the organizers of Deep Time was that only myself and one other were from Cumbria. The rest of them were imported from God knows where, London, I suspect. And when I said to the chap who runs the project, well, how are they going to write about someone where they don't know where it is? And he said, well, we're bringing them up for an orientation for three days. And, I, and one of those days was spent at Sellafield. So I thought, hmm, it, it, we had a, a, quite a, a lengthy conversation about this, this chap and I. And I think the word colonialism was used uh, by me about, you know, assuming that you can import people who then, you know, get the essence of something and go away again and write something which captures a very rich, complex area. I, I was not altogether um, enamored of the way that was done, but I was very enamored with the money they gave me to write the play. So you know, <laughs> I can't complain. Um, so, the other one is, let's, I want to be clear about this. This, is, this project is about a play about Millam, for Millam, in Millam, and with Millam, because all our actors are from Millam. Um, the great. chap from London, for the arts, pro arts project person said, oh, I can get you a stage design and I can get you this. I said, no, don't want it. The, art, the stage designer comes from Millam. Um, the actors come from Millam. None of them, they're all, you've said Andram people weren't well, hardly even that never some of them never acted before some have some haven't we've got three children two from Millam school one from Coniston school who is a Millam uh, resident from Coniston school we've got um four ladies of a certain age that's my age um the the, the biggest compromise we're having to make at the moment is that one of our actors because we cannot find anybody else to run this to do this part may have to come from Barrow and we've had long discussions about whether this, <laughs> this is appropriate to this person comes from Barrow. Um, uh, we may have to go with it because we can't, we can't find anybody in Millam at the moment willing to take this part on because it's quite central to the play. Um, so that's, that's a big compromise. The, the people who are coming to film it are coming from Whitehaven. Apologies to everybody, but they, they are, it's quite a, a sophisticated team we need to film both the film, the live version and the staged version, and then put the film together. So I, I was having, I had to look around to see who could manage that. And they're coming from Whitehaven. Um, but apart from that, it's a Millen project. That's great. Yeah. Really, really involving, fantastic. Yes, yeah. Yes, as the Arts Council said, when they turned us down for the second time for funding, it's, it has all the hallmarks of a splendid community project, but they still turned this down. And in the end, I said, uh, let's stuff the Arts Council and we'll do it ourselves. So we are. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. That's really great and yeah, really nice to hear all that. Could you just say a bit more, Ruth, about this business about filming the production? Yeah. Well, yeah. What's that all about? And, and what, what, what film will... will well, will... We, we, we've got two live performances, right? I think that's going to be quite a popular thing to go and see because there's only two performances. Um, and there's a lot of, not a lot of talk, but a fair number of people in Millam are already quite heavily involved with this. And I think it'll, it'll be popular in the town. So we, I wanted to feel that it was more than just transient as an experience. And we wanted to have something that was offerable to other communities where this kind of one crop economy collapse has happened. Pit, pit villages, I was thinking of particularly, um, not just in Cumbria, but elsewhere. Uh, and we wanted, I wanted, this was me really, I wanted something that you could, you could show people or they could borrow and show for themselves that would resonate with other communities where these kinds of issues had been um, important. And the only way to do that, you can't tour a bunch of people who are in school or working or, you know, amateur actors, you can't tour them. So, and the play could be 
offered to another theatre in other parts of the world, but it would lose its millimness in the process. And it is very much based in and around the culture and the language of Millen. So the only way to capture it was on film. And we knew that just sticking a camera at the back of the theatre wasn't going to work because um, it would look like, you know, the <laughs> nativity play kind of thing. It, the sound would be poor. So we, I just decided in the end we would put a, a film, one of the live performances, and then film a staged performance on the Sunday after the performances on uh, the live ones on Friday and Saturday. We would spend Sunday um, doing the staged version, just like they do at the other when they see plays um, produced in London or wherever. And then the film editors would put the two together into something that captured both the spontaneity of the live performance and made sure that some of the close-ups and the, and the um, uh, voices were properly recorded. So that's the plan. Sorry, that, that sounds great. And, um, you know, again, there's, a, there's another Nicholson resonance there, isn't there? The fact that so much of his poetry matters because you don't have to live in Milan to recognise yeah, absolutely. the emotions that he's talking about. And you're, you're going down the same route here. You, you, you know, you're seeing the same, the same, the same essence yeah. of the story which would be recognised in all sorts of other places. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. You're going from the particular to the general. And, and it's not everybody's experience, but it, is, it isn't a unique experience to this town. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Brian Worley, did you want to come in with a question? Uh, yes, it, it was just, uh, uh, I've been very impressed with uh, what we're just being here. Uh, I am assuming, Ruth, that there's absolutely nothing to... Um, no union organisation at all involved with no. the um, with the mine workers. No, we're all amateurs. No, 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 no. Sorry, I didn't mean the production. I meant uh, at the, the the closure of the uh, of the ironworks itself. I mean, maybe that's a, a question for David Boyd as much as anything else. Well, it, it, I couldn't. I couldn't. I mean, the, there were boilermaker. There were furnace men's unions. There were unions involved, um, but the. They tended to be, of, um, David will correct me, I'm sure, on this. The ones that I've been aware of were the um, smaller, um, what can I say, um, very specific uh, associations of particular right, kinds of yes. persons. The, 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 than, is that right, David? The unions in the steel industry of the time were very diverse and fragmented. Yeah. There was never a, a general, the, the biggest general steel workers union was known as the Iron Steel Trades Confederation. And, and that was predominantly the production operatives, the, the labourers and uh, very occupational specific uh, production operatives. But Actually, the, you, you mentioned the engineers, the AU, the Amalgamated Engineering Union, uh, organised all the maintenance workers and the steel workers couldn't, uh, couldn't produce without their input. So they virtually controlled the, the whole thing as well. And then there was the, particularly Millen, because it was an ironworks, would have been dominated by the national, well, at the time, the National Union of Blast Furnishmen, which subsequently merged with the Iron and Steel Trades Confederation. But it, in those days, there were uh, daggers drawn, they were very, on very bad terms, indeed. So, you know, there was no love lost between them. Oh. So the whole thing was um, very fragmented union-wise. There wasn't any any sort of union solidarity much in the steel industry. There were lots of tiny unions yeah. as well. You know, um, I could mention about half a dozen more replaced, but uh, but I but I won't. But uh, 
it, it was all a bit, all a bit of a fragmenting mess. Yeah. yeah, and it doesn't that doesn't all go well for United Action or fast decisions or you know that's why there was the only protest that was put on on the day at the time was this business of the women of the town deciding to make a fuss. And that went down like a lead budgie in some quarters as well, I'm afraid, yeah. because they, if they were, the men were desperate to, to have other industry come to the town to replace what they were about to lose. And they didn't think that having the town represented as a dead town uh, was going to help. They didn't want to make a fuss in case it put off other people who might come and give them work. So it was it was a very, yeah, as David said, fragmented and um, unclear situation as regards to how the, how the protest might have been managed. Yeah, it was a very, very local thing. It never really uh, effectively spread to the seat of government where the decisions actually got made. Mm. You know, they didn't really care about a little local disturbance in no. Milham. You know, it didn't uh, didn't worry them at all, I'm sure. And the, of course, it was a Labour town council, a Labour MP, a Labour government. And there was this sort of feeling that, oh, they can't let this happen. But as David said, nobody at the last resort seemed to care at all that Milham was going to go down the toilet. Right. Right. Um, on a slightly different thing, Ruth, um, you, you mentioned the shock and, and the lack of knowledge elsewhere. Um, you might like to have a look at um, Norman's poem, Glen Orkey, where he, actually, where, where he was in Glen Orkey and he saw it in a newspaper headline that it was to close in four weeks time, mm -hmm. which, which might be something that you could bring into that for as a, I don't know, I'll, I'll leave you to the dramaturge bit, but. Um, yeah. Well, it, I doubt it, it now, I'm afraid it was script a bit late now, the script's done. And as I said to you. Oh, is it? Oh, right. Um, okay. yeah. Oh yeah, the script's been written over quite a while. And it, if you overload it, if you overload this rather, it's got a quite short play with yeah. too much stuff. You, there's um in in historical fiction there is a there's a phrase that people use sometimes when they say um, oh dear your research is showing because historical authors have this tendency to try and pack useful and what they see to be riveting information into a fiction and it it puts the reader off because it's too dense and I I do worry that I'll, I'm gonna I have I've struggled to make it to reflect some complexity without getting too much into the, the detail of that might just bog the whole thing down. So where, where are you up to now um, exactly, Ruth, in terms of the, the process of bringing it to the stage? Did you say that you were um, you had to conclude the audition process? Uh, we've got three more auditions next week. Was it week after? Week after next. Um, with just a couple of, of roles yet to fill. And then we will meet as a cast after about August bank holiday. There was no point because everybody was away. Uh, people were away a lot and it coming and going. There was no point in trying to get people together until the beginning of September when we will get together as a whole cast. There'll be about, um, how many are there all together? I can't remember about 10, nine or 10. And Jackie and me and the stage designer and the, you know, the, the people who are helping us We'll all get together, work out a rehearsal schedule uh, that suits everybody and crack on mm. and, and aim to do our final rehearsals at the very end of October and kick off in the theatre on the 4th and 5th of November. Well, has there been much discussion between yourself and Jackie about the date of November the 5th? Maybe some well, noises uh, well it, wasn't, it wasn't so much a choice as, well, to be, to be perfectly honest, we were aiming originally at the middle of September. And it turned out to be impossible um, because August is such a fragmented month in terms of people's availability. And if we'd left it, if we'd left it in the middle of September, that would have given us only about two clear weeks for rehearsal. And it just wasn't going to be enough. No matter how much stuff we could have got done before August, that, that gap of time just wasn't big enough. 
But by the time I took that decision that I couldn't see it being successful in the middle of September and went back to Jackie in the theatre and said, we're going to have to find time in November. Her, her programme for November was almost already done. Uh, and the whole of October was done as well. And the only weekend left to us was bonfire weekend. And I thought, OK, well, you know, that's just tough. Um, I'm sure the cast and the crew won't mind, but... And if people can't come on the Friday night because they've got this and that to do, they'll come on the Saturday night or vice versa. So we'll just have to work around it. We will have to compete with Bonfire Night, but it wasn't a choice. That was the only weekend left to us. Okay. Right. Um, okay, well, our, our time is really rampaging on. Um, I mean, I, I'm not too fussed about uh, closing on the dot of half past eight as originally advertised. Um, and I would like to um, talk a little bit about uh, Ruth's novels, but does anybody have any other questions to do with the play before we before we move on? If so, please wave madly or just unmute. Okay, uh, Ruth. Just before we do move on from the play, um, I, I know I know you you were quite keen to um, um, you know talk to members of the Nicholson Society about about this. It, it, are there any points that you would like to make? to us at the moment, which haven't cropped up already? I don't think so. I mean, I was interested in what you were saying about um, opening up the Norman and Nicholson house, uh, because it, that house to me is where I go to Graham Dawson and get a, get my physio. So it's <laughs> it, it, the first time I realized that I was, you know, getting my physio in, in the house where Norman lived and that the back room where Graham and I used to do our work together was the back kitchen where they and the front was the shop and you know having read Norman's biography and Wednesday early closing and you know having read about the man um, known about him for a very long time it was it was surreal to go and get my my Achilles tendon fixed in his in his back kitchen you know, it was <laughs> bizarre so I'm I'm very pleased that you've managed to rescue that house back and make something of it because it always struck me as very odd that that Millam's famous poet didn't have it in the town anything that really commemorated who he was when he lived in that house all his life. Yeah. Well, we're not completely there yet, but you know. A, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a great yeah. project. Oh, the Ash, by the way, the Norman Nicholson comments. Trail, wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great stuff. We've done with our walking group did one of those walks and it was a big hit. Fantastic. Oh, wow, that's really nice to know. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so um, how on earth then, Ruth, do you move from a career as an education consultant to a novelist, and not just a novelist, but a successful novelist as well, with one novel that then begets another and begets another? Um, what, what kind of master plan was this? It wasn't a master plan at all. The only master plan was I wanted to write a novel. And when I was working and traveling, which I did for 25 more years um, as a consultant, self-employed, I never had the time. I, I was writing a lot of nonfiction, a lot of work, stuff to do with my work, but never had the time to write fiction. And that was when I moved up here from Salford, and that was on my list of things I not wanted to do was to write a novel. So I began thinking about it as soon as I came to live in Robothwaite and uh, went on a course called How to Write a Novel, which seemed like a good idea. Five days, Monday to Friday. Thought by Friday, I'll know how to write this novel. And I'd given myself a sabbatical. This was back, way back in 2008. I'd given myself a sabbatical for six months because, and you have to plan that in because my work just went on and on and on. So I planned this break around my 60th birthday and went at, at the beginning of the break, went on this course and thought that I'd have the novel cracked and finished by the end of my sabbatical, which was the, the September. Uh, well, it didn't work out like that really, I'm afraid. So, but, and the first novel took me four years because it was trial and error and it was a hopeless mess for quite a long time. It was much harder than I expected. And by the time you've spent four years and feel that you've got to grips with something, then to write one novel seemed a terrible waste of my time and investment. Um, so I kept going. I just thought, well, I'll, I'll carry on. And then I got to three 
And oh, and it was wonderful. The research was so interesting about coal in Whitehaven and then about the Sellafield fire in 57. I just got so into the research and really enjoyed the writing of that trilogy. And after that, I just thought, well, where do I go now? And I thought, well, I'll have a go at crime fiction and see how we get on. But I, I think it, it is quite, you know, I think, I mean, obviously you're glossing over quite a lot here, but I think it does take something extra in a writer to be able to move from somebody who was great at research to be able then to use that information in such a vibrant way as we see in, in your novels, the characterization, the dialogue that we saw before, the plot lines, the keeping things up your sleeve, revealing them at the right time. You need to be much more than a researcher to make it work. Um, well, I suppose so. But I, apart from the five days on how to write a novel, um, I think I knew at the end of those five days that I, I was writing little bits and you, you were in a group and you share them with the group. And the feedback I was getting and the feeling I was getting was that I could, I could do this. I could, in microcosm, I could handle bits of what would, I would need to, to, to cope with to write a, a big novel. The, it was scaling up from the small bits to the, the, to the 90,000 words that was the hard part because keeping track of things is not my forte, to be honest. And remembering that somebody you've called Susan in chapter four you can't call Caroline in chapter six, you know, because it doesn't work. Keeping track of all that was was a discipline that I had to learn, but I knew I could write. I, I knew from an early age when I was at school that I could write. Um, and, I, and I always felt when I was writing nonfiction that the genre was cramping my style and that I could, I could write better than I was allowed to writing in a more academic mode. And it was just a release of a, a skill or a, an interest that I'd had for a very long time when I finally got down to doing it. Right. OK, so does, does anybody have any questions for, for Ruth about the novels? Um, I'm quite happy to rattle on, but I don't I don't want anybody else to. Oh, think, can't you know think me, I could talk. <laughs> Do, do you have um, see, when when we read your books, I guess we you know we all have our favourite characters, and I just wondered if you have favourite characters because your favourites might be the bad guys. Mm. I'm quite fond of Sam Tognarelli. <laughs> um, he's not the most dynamic and not the most charismatic, but he's an honest bloke. He tries hard. He, he gets confused about things, particularly in relationships. Um, he makes mistakes. But he, he's a trier. He's honest. And an honest policeman in the, in the 60s, in 70s in this area was, you know, a good, a good thing. So I like Sam. I like Jessie in the trilogy because she had flaws and she had a she didn't think carefully enough before she spoke. So every now and then she would, I would write, find myself writing something that she was saying, while at the same time saying to her, saying to myself, you can't say that, you know, that's, that it's rude, it's in inconsiderate, it's insensitive, whatever. But there she was, you know, getting into all sorts of trouble because she said stuff that just occurred to her without thinking it through. And I like that feeling of, of, um, directness that she had so you do yeah you do you you, you get into people I, some of my villains there's a chap in the last book who in, in collateral damage who means well but gets himself into difficulties um and he ends up being a baddie but almost by accident because he he gets sucked into something that he doesn't really he can't really control, but he, he, he started off all right. I'm not giving much away here, am I? No, that's all right. Um, so yes, I, there was a bloke in the first book who was out and out baddie. He was a very manipulative, controlling man. And what horrified me when I, when I got reactions to the first book was the number of women who said how attractive they found him. And that was, that was a bit of a worry. 
because he was certainly not meant to be an attractive man. But there must have been something about him that appealed to people. He didn't appeal to me. I suppose, uh, you know, as an author, you let your characters off the leash the moment the book goes to the bookseller, don't you? And then people will make of it what they will. Yes. yes. No control then. No, no control over that. No. Yeah. I'm just also curious, really... Sorry. I'm sorry, just David. curious, Ruth, uh, where you got the Togner Alanium from. Did you? Uh, <laughs> Did you ice cream visit, from a coffee uh, shop, David. It was a, a coffee place. Place. Look at a few coffee bars. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I was at Ulverston School in the 60s. And we used to go downtown after school and go in Deganis's. And so I, I knew that there was a kind of culture of Italian sounding coffee shops in West Cumbria. And I, I just thought, well, Tognarelli sounds like an interesting name because it, it causes all him all sorts of friction about every time he meets anybody, they ask if he, his dad made ice cream. And he, you know, it's the kind of running trope in the story that no, no, nothing to do with ice cream. But the trouble there's, was there's, that sorry, making sorry, Togner Ellie, there's, sorry? There's, there's quite a clan of Togner Ellie. Oh yeah, in, absolutely, in absolutely. Working, not just cafe owners, which yeah, yeah, is yeah, yeah. A, yeah. Lot, uh, a lot fewer cafes than used to be, but, uh, one was a lecturer at the college. And, oh, really? Uh, well, there you go. All kinds of things. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, at least one worked at the steelworks. So they were right. all, uh, all quite a, quite a spread out family. Right. Well, I feel even page. better about that choice of name now in that case. Yeah, yeah. It, is. it was a mistake really in the sense that I have that. to spell, every time I had to spell it when I was typing. It used to trip me up every time. I just wish I'd called him Smith or Bloggs or something, you know, because that would be so much easier. I, I thought, um, I mean, what I was fascinated uh, by was the fact that, you know, as well as plunging into the world of police, you've also gone headfirst into the world of journalism. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, yes, somebody did Yeah, the, the, the relations. The, journalists, in, the, um, the, the office of the, the evening mail or whatever it was, the Furnace yeah. News that I called it. Yeah. Um, in the first in the first of the crime books, somebody did say to me, well, you were obviously a local journalist at some point. I said, no, I just made it all up. And I did. I made all, I mean, I absolutely made all that up. I didn't have any idea about the, the nasty sub editor lurking in his cupboard or anything. But um, I had a I had a I mean, I was at work myself while at that time. And um, I just thought I, I'm guessing, but I think it probably was something like this. And it turned out to be a rather too accurate portrait of local journalism in 1969 than it than I than I'd realized. Yeah, absolutely. I think you hit the target there. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> well, the sub sub editors were always the bane of our lives anyway, you know, speaking as a as a former uh reporter. Uh you know, you you would in you would you would hand over your copy with great trepidation and quite often you know, it depended on who the sub editor was. Yeah, exactly. Because you know, you knew that some of them were basically frustrated writers, and they would stop at nothing to totally destroy yeah. any kind of style you'd try yeah. to implant in your there own. You yeah. Turn up looking almost unrecognizable. But I um, think I must have guessed at that at some subliminal level. I must have guessed that that would have been a tension. Yeah. And if you make if you make the sub editor a loathsome sexist at the same time, and put a young female reporter into the mix, then it's all sorts of things going to happen, aren't there? And you've you've also got ninety percent of the journalistic world on your side immediately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it was fun. I enjoyed writing that bit. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, so once the play is done and dusted, do mm. do you have more uh, novels, more crime stories uh, burning away on the back burner? No. No. Uh, no. And I've done that'll be nine books and a, and a play when that's done. And as I get well into my 70s, well into my 70s, um, and life is short, you think to yourself, well, this is the, as the writing for the last 10 years has been almost full time because I self publish. So it's the research, the planning, the writing, the, all the publication procedures I, han I manage myself with the help of people to do various bits, but I project manage the whole thing. And that takes, it takes at least a year from, for each book. And that's, that's a lot of hours, a lot of hours, and a lot of uh, intrusion on my time. 
And during the lockdowns, well, I thought, well, fair enough. What else do I want to do? You know, why, why not? That's fine. So I carried on. But once we're out of lockdown, we were out of lockdown and we started traveling again and I wanted to do other things and still want to do other things. Then I, I began, I'm beginning to evaluate how much time does this take? And is there room in my life just for this one activity? Or do I want to make sure that I, I spread, I learn new things? So I'm not at the moment sure whether I'll ever do anything else in the writing line. I'm not, I just don't know. I'll have to get this play done and then see how I feel. And if I've got time on my hands and no other big projects to deal with and when we're not going anywhere or doing anything, then I might go back to it, but I'm not sure at the moment. My options are open. Well, you might find that being a dramatist is a bug that bites deep, you never know. But it's not just the dramatist, it's, it's, I wouldn't be as interested in the drama if it wasn't for the subject matter. Yeah. And you can't just keep writing wordy plays about important local issues because, well, you could, I suppose, but I'm not sure I want to do that either. Right. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I think we're probably drawing towards the end of our evening with Ruth Sutton, but um, would anybody like to chip in with any other comments, questions, whether it's to do with anything we've actually been discussing tonight or anything else that uh, you would like to ask Ruth about? Now is the chance. Okay. It looks, looks like we're all done. Well, okay. Ruth, what can I say? Thank you very much indeed for joining us tonight. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, yeah, I can see that there is a round of applause rippling oh. across the Zoom network, <laughs> which is very well deserved. Um, I think, I mean, I think we've all we've all learned a lot because it's not it's not every evening that you get the chance to actually sit down and have such an intimate conversation with somebody who we're really only familiar with from the written page. So that has been a real insight. And also, you know, I think that as members of the Nicholson Society, um, we identify so much with matters to do with Milham, with matters to do with the heritage, with the things that Norman wrote about, and to find these issues being given this new and dramatic lease of life right now in 2022 is, is really great. And I'm sure everybody would agree with me in wishing you all the very, very best with the production. I know you've got a heck of a lot of work to do between now and the fourth and afterwards as you you know you move on to making this available in film format yeah. for the audiences to see so the very best of luck with that uh, please do keep in touch and anything that we can do in terms of publicity etc you know we'll be only too happy to do when the time comes that's great thanks very much thank you everybody and, okay yeah and thank you charlie for asking all the questions that i wanted to ask <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I hope I didn't steal your thoughts, Kathleen. Thank you very much. Not at all. You asked really interesting, revealing questions. Great. Okay. Nice to see you, Kathleen. Thank you. And you, Ruth. <laughs> okay. Right. Okay. Thank you very much, then, one and all. We will declare the evening closed. And once again, thank you, Ruth, and good night. Cheers. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.